maybe a different endpoint which is streaming to a different link. <laughs> I need a push. Waiting for, still waiting for. Hmm. There you go. We are live. Waiting for, still waiting for. I can see myself on YouTube, so I guess we are live. Yes, we're live. All right, so let's uh, let's start with the opening then. Just in tab. Here you go. So, hello, everybody, and thank you very much for joining tonight's meetup uh, organized by Data Science Milan. Tonight, we're going to talk about machine learning design patterns. Uh, before we start with the talk, let me give you a brief introduction to our community. We are an independent group that was founded on February 2016. Uh, it's a technical community, uh, not powered by any specific company. It counts uh, more than 1.7 thousand members. Uh, initially, we were based on Milan, uh, physically based on Milan and doing physical events. But uh, we are now turned into an online uh, community. So we meet once a month uh, in events like this one. We are also part of the Italian Association for Machine Learning. Uh, together with other communities. And the staff is, uh, those are all the people that uh, organize the events. Uh, unfortunately, you won't be able to meet them in person <laughs> tonight, uh, but if you want to reach any of them, uh, you can find us uh, generally on Slack. I, uh, this is our main channel for communications. And uh, uh, we, we're looking for other volunteers that wants to join the staff, in particular, um, Right now, we're looking for a social media manager, somebody who can take, uh, can help uh, uh, Marco with the social media post, uh, as well as the contents on our website. The next event is going to be on February the 18th, and it's about the DLV AI system, uh, which is a, uh, an intelligent system based on disjunctive logic programming. And it is organized in collaboration with the democratized AI community. All right, uh, if you're looking for the previous events, you can find all of the recordings uh, on the YouTube channel, as well as the slides are published on our slide share deck. Uh, uh, so if you go to datasciencemilan.org, you will find all of the references. We also have a blog on Medium, where uh, after each event, we write a summary, uh, all the key, uh, the highlights of, of the talk. So it's also a good place to you know, see, get the summary of all of the events over the last years. And you will find this event as well in a few days. We uh, uh, manage this uh, monthly digest. It, it is a newsletter. We only send you once uh, an email once a month and we, we summarize all of the, rel of the relevant events, the relevant articles, tutorials, all of the relevant news. So if you want to join, you can go to digest uh, .science .org, um and please do that because our editor put a lot of effort for curating this newsletter. So I strongly invite you to join. 
As I was saying before, we use Slack as a main tool for communicating with other community members. You can use it tonight as well uh, if you want to ask questions at the end of the uh, or during the talk or at the end of the talk. Uh, if you don't use Slack, you can uh, just uh, add a comment in the chat in a YouTube video. Um, otherwise, you can, if you want to reach other members to have a further discussion even after the event, you can join on Slack. In order to request the invitation, you can do that from the website datasciencemilan.org. As well as we're working on this new initiative, which is the technical coaching, where we will have a coach uh, giving a topic uh, for discussion. You can do all the ask me everything you want. That will still happen through Slack. So in case you're interested, this is uh, going to be available in the next months. All right. So um, if you want to organize an event with us, this is our email address, datasciencemilan at gmail.com. We are very happy to welcome everybody. So world board from the community members. Uh, I would start with a few uh, job openings from the companies in our community. Um, the first job opening is uh, with the bank Illimity. It's a data science position based in Milan. There's Qubit, that is a company uh, providing cloud infrastructure products and services. And they're looking for a data engineer and this is a Milan and also a remote opportunity. Coveo um, is a famous uh, software as a service digital experiences platform. They're looking at data engineer for their R&D team. And uh, again, it's uh, based on different location and also a remote opportunity, I guess. Uh, there's Brinley uh, that is currently hiring uh, for a bunch of uh, very senior roles, uh, starting from a lead and a senior positions for data scientists, senior data analysts, machine learning engineers, information retrieval engineer, and machine le learning operation infrastructure engineer. So if you're interested on the working in the ed tech, this is a, a very good place to be. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, uh, a few other events that's going to happen in the next days or weeks. There's a deep learning summit happening uh, in, a, in two days. There's a, a, um, an event about uh, using AI for uh, payments and fraud risk management, uh, which will be on the same dates uh, the day after tomorrow. There's a, a conference, a virtual conference on uh, the beginning of February organized by the Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence. It's a virtual salon of, organized by the Design Salon that is about uh, AI to healthcare finance on technology. And uh, there's also a summit for AI for finance that will take place at the beginning of March. Okay, if you would like to uh, promote any of, uh, op opening opportunity in your team, any news, any uh, relevant event, you can send us you know, by email. We'll publish it in the world board in the next event, as well as in the newsletter. So the agenda for today, we have Michael Mann. Uh, do I spell correctly, Michael? Yeah, that's, that's, that's right, Michael Mann. All right. Uh, so, uh, Michael is a machine learning solutions architect at Google and author of the machine learning design patterns book. So I will, he will make his uh, introduction as part of the talk, uh, before we, we start just uh, a quick, uh, you know, uh, favor to ask you, uh, is that we need to be, um, um, you need to help us on spreading the word, uh, get us, um, known, um, by other communities, uh, especially online presence. So we can ask if you could, you know, follow our social um, accounts as well as post and you know mention us uh, during the event and after. Thank you very much and enjoy the event. I will ask Michael to grab the ball and start presenting. Okay, I'll uh, share my screen. Let me... Okay. So I think everyone should be able to see my screen now. Um, I'll get started. 
thanks so much uh, for the introduction. Um, and thanks so much for the opportunity to come and talk about this book and talk about just machine learning design patterns in general. Um, as John Mario said, my name is Michael Munn. I'm a machine learning solutions engineer at Google. And uh, I have put my email address here, munn at google.com. If you have any questions uh, later or anything comes to mind later, feel free, feel free to reach out. Okay. So just a little bit about what we're going to be talking about. So design patterns, uh, depending on your background, perhaps in like computer, so computer software or uh, engineering or machine learning even, but design patterns are formalized best practices that they're, they're used over and over again to solve common problems uh, that show up when designing a software system. And so the idea of this book is the three of us, Slack, Sarah, and I are all, we're all machine learning engineers of some sort at Google. And um, we have a lot of experience in Google Cloud working with customers, uh, building machine learning solutions. And in doing so, the similar kind of design patterns that you would see in software, building a software system, you see similar design patterns showing up in building machine learning solutions. And so that's the idea of the book, is just a, a list, a compendium um, of giving a name to some of these commonly used design patterns. So if you're, if you're already familiar with machine learning, then likely a lot of these patterns will be very familiar to you. Um, the way we wrote it was we wrote it so that it would be a way of giving a name to a pattern you're probably already using, just to make it easier to communicate with colleagues, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and just as a, a high level overview of what the, the book entails, we tried to break down all the different patterns into different sort of aspects. You can think about how these, these patterns show up in the different aspects of a machine learning life cycle. So everything from like the problem formulation, the figuring out the data representation, the, the problem representation, uh, to training the model, problem, patterns involving ML ops, deployment, continuous um, you know, resilience, um, reproducibility, things like that. And so um, there's a, this picture on the right-hand side just shows a breakdown of the different chapters and how the different patterns are related to each other. Because as you can imagine, a lot of patterns, one pattern will often, often reference different other pattern. Um, and so there, you know, this is meant to give some idea of like how the patterns are related to each other. For the purposes of this talk, I just want to give some idea of what this book entails and what and, and highlight some of the patterns that there seem to be interested in the group. So we're going to focus on um, three design patterns and just give a, a little deep dive into these three patterns to give you a flavor for what what they look like um, and what they what they entail. So first, we're going to talk about rebalancing. So again, this is a design pattern that shows up in the problem representation chapter. Um, sorry, I'm trying to keep track of the questions in, uh, okay. Okay. I'll keep that in mind. Thanks. I'll, I'm trying to keep track of the questions as they arrive in, um, in the YouTube channel as well. So if you have questions, please ask questions along the way. Um, I also plan to talk about, uh, useful overfitting, which actually shows up in the chapter on, uh, patterns that modify the training loop. And then we'll end with talking about um, explainable predictions, which is the very, very final chapter on responsible AI. So I'll get started, but as I said, like if you have questions, feel free to like put them in the YouTube chat, and I'll try to answer them there. I'm also going to plan to leave some room at the end of at the end of these three patterns to to see if there's to answer any questions that have come up. So I'll try to deal with them as they come along, but um, we may just deal with them at the end. Okay, so to start, uh, I'll talk about rebalancing. So this is the the tenth design pattern. It shows up in the chapter on the problem representation. So how you're how you're representing your problem in machine learning. So again, like this probably speaks a lot to your own personal experience in machine learning. But most real world data sets aren't perfectly balanced. Um, when you're looking at a data set, say you're doing a binary classification, um, you know, oftentimes you'll have one class is is overrepresented. In your in your in your data set, this particularly happens a lot when you're dealing with things like anomaly detection or multi-class classification or multi-label classification, which we also talk about in the book, um, or anytime you're trying to predict the occurrence of a rare event. It just it will happen where you'll have imbalanced data. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, and sometimes. You know, this, 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 the, the, the problem with this is it leads to bias in training your model. And you have to be con conscious of unfair bias uh, versus naturally occurring bias. 
So bias is often, but not always a bad thing. Like you can have bias in your data set because it's naturally occurring. Like you're just, you, you know, anomalies occur very infrequently. Um, and so your, your model be biased to predict things as being non-anomalous. You also want to weigh that against uh, unfair bias that may occur in your data set. And we talk about this in a little bit more detail. This relates well to the, the fairness design pattern in responsible AI chapter. But when there's unfair bias is when your data set doesn't accurately reflect the population that you want to be using for your model. And so, you know, that's a different problem in some sense. What we're talking about now is like, you may have naturally occurring bias in your data, like imbalanced data. And how do we go about rebalancing the data to be able to, um, to, to create a, a, good, a good fit for purpose machine learning model? So one thing that comes to mind first is choosing the right evaluation metrics. So oftentimes when you're dealing with imbalanced data and in your mind, you can think about like a binary classification task, you know, accuracy may not be the best metric because accuracy, uh, your model can just, you know, predict everything as being um, non-anomalous and have really high accuracy because the data set itself is imbalanced. Um, and so you want to think about other uh, evaluation metrics that you can use. And oftentimes it really helps to look at a confusion matrix something where you're breaking down the true labels against your model's predicted labels to really see like, where's your model getting its questions, getting the answers wrong. And when you have an imbalanced data set, you know, we discuss solutions to this design pattern. Um, and there's three techniques that come to mind. One is downsampling, the other is upsampling and weighted classes. And so I'll just go into a little bit of detail of what these look like. So with downsampling, you have, uh, again, thinking of a binary classification task, you have your majority class and your minority class. For downsampling, you just take a random sample of your majority class and you discard it from your training data set. So you, you really you just ignore that, that aspect of the data. Um, and then you train your model using only that subset of the majority class and the minority class. In doing so, what you've done is you've, you've sort of put both your labels, your major majority class and minority class on level footing when training the model. Um, another technique we can do is upsampling. So with upsampling, you have a overrepresented majority class. And then what you can do is generate new data from your minority class. And this can be done in different, different ways, right? So there's different techniques for doing any kind of like sampling techniques like this. Um, one thing you can do is uh, generate artificial samples using a technique like SMOAT. The other thing you, go, you see people often do is just repeat examples, like do a random draw from your minority class and then repeat examples. You should think in your mind that when you're doing this, when you're training your model, model either through downsampling or through upsampling, what you're doing is you're showing your model more and more examples of this, of either class, either the majority class or the minority class. And you're hoping your model is learning some relationship or some pattern between how those features of those two classes relate to their respective labels. So um, for this reason, sometimes people lean towards using upsampling just because with downsampling, you're throwing away some examples, right? Like you're taking some of your majority class and you're removing those examples from your training data set. So you're, you're not allowing your model to see a relationship between those features and how those features, those examples relate to your label. And so when you're thinking about upsampling, one technique is called, uh, that maybe you've come across is called SMOTE. And SMOTE stands for Synthetic Minority Oversampling Technique. Um, and this is actually SMOAT refers to by now like a collection of various techniques. And the idea is exactly like you have an underrepresented class and then what you wanna be able to do is generate some new examples. So some examples that some, sit somewhere in between the labeled examples of your existing data set. So on the left-hand side, we have two real data sets from the minority class. In this case, it's a, health, uh, a healthcare data set. We have measurements involving the glucose, the blood pressure, skin thickness, thickness, et cetera. And then by using SMOTE, we generate a new data point. And this is a, a brand new synthetic data point. And it will borrow the label from the two real data points. But this data set does not exist from a human being. Like it gives you, a, we have a glucose blood pressure measuring, blood pressure, et cetera, measure, measures. But these don't actually relate to, a, to an, a, an actual reading from a human. These are just purely synthetic data points. And they're meant to provide a way for the model to learn that relationship between how those features relate to this underrepresented label. Another technique you can use when, um, when dealing with, with rebalancing data is weighting the different classes. So in this class, you, you don't really affect your data set so much, but you can modify your training prop, your, your, your training loop or the, the, uh, the training loss. 
And so what you want to do is you, 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 you devise a method to incentivize your model to learn better the underrepresented class. So you, you have a way of saying, tell the model to pay more attention to the, to the minority class. I should have also mentioned, but in, in throughout the book, you know, we have a GitHub repository where we have code examples that explain and put into code a lot of the ideas that we discuss in the design patterns, mostly just as a way of, um, of, of illustrating the ideas, not just in theory, but really in practice. And so, um, you know, this is a code snippet from that repository, this section on rebalancing. You know, a lot of the code we work in is we use, we have code in TensorFlow and PyTorch. Here, what we're looking at is, 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 is Keras code. And um, this is a way that you can incorporate into your Keras model when you're training your model uh, a weighted class. So um, as a rule of thumb, what you'll do is you'll define a class weight for your minority class and your majority class. And this can look like the first two lines of code here where we set up our, our, our class weights. What we're, for either one, what we're taking is one over the number of examples we have um, in, our, in our minority or majority examples, divided by the total number of examples, and then divided by two because we have a binary classification problem here. And so when you're actually training your model, training a Keras model, you know, using something like uh, the, the model.fit method, you pass it your training data and your training labels. And there's also an argument you can pass your class weights. And so what this is doing under the hood in Keras is it's assigning then that weight to each of the examples. So you're punishing your model more, you're punishing your loss more for getting wrong a minority class example. And you're doing this as a way of balancing back out your data set in the training process. So we haven't changed our data. We're gonna see a lot more examples of our majority, majority class. By modifying the training loss in this way, we're able to then penalize our model for getting the minority class wrong and force it to pay a little bit more attention to those examples. So um, that's just three techniques. And you know, really, you know, as a summary, there's downsampling where you remove some of your overrepresented class. There's upsampling where you can um, repeat or you can uh, generate new examples of your upsample of your minority class. And then there's weighted classes where you can just actually cause your, you know, modify your loss functions. We discussed some other techniques as well, but one thing to take away is that, you know, these three techniques, you don't have to pick just one. And if you're, if you've ever dealt with that, if you've ever like worked with imbalanced data, or you've actually come across this in a use case that you've worked on, you've probably found yourself experimenting with one or all of these techniques. And so, um, you know, like with most mo machine learning modeling, it comes down to a lot of experimentation. Uh, you can try one or you can try multiple. Okay, so that's just a, a quick intro to, to rebalancing. Next, I'm going to go into uh, useful overfitting. So again, I, I think most people probably have some background in machine learning, but you know, it's, you know, one of the goals of machine learning model is to generalize and be able to make reliable predictions on new unseen data. And so very quickly in a machine learning class, you learn about underfitting and overfitting and, and bias and variance. And you may see a picture like this, right? Where we have a data set here represented by these black dots. And um, it, looks, it, looks somewhat, um, it looks somewhat like you know, they're, they're quadratic. And we have you know, these three little, three ways of accessing the problem. On the left-hand side, it's extremely underfit. We're trying to understand like a quadratic data set with a linear model, so it's gonna be underfit. On, in the, in the, on, the, on the extreme right-hand side, the model's overfit. It's a high-degree polynomial. It's, it's fitting our training data set almost too perfectly. It's hitting every single point. The, the best model that we want to go for, aim for, is something that's more of like um, not overfit or underfit. It's a good fit. It's robust. It sort of matches the quadratic data um, more linearly, uh, more, 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 more accurately, in the sense that when we, when we then expect to see unseen data points, data that we didn't train our model on, we, we want our model to have a good error. Right? We want to be able to generalize so we don't suffer for future predictions. And the way this is done in machine learning is you do a train validation split. Um, typically, you'll do a train validation and test split. But just to focus on, on overfitting here, let me just talk about train and validation uh, splits. So what you'll do is you'll take all of your data, and you'll, you'll split it into your training set and your validation set. And then during your typical training loop, so this, this, pattern, this pattern shows up in the chapter on um, patterns that modify the typical training loop. So let me just briefly mention the typical training loop. You'll take your training data, and taking batches of data, you'll improve the parameters of your model. Uh, think about a neural network using gradient descent, for example. And then along the way, you'll do little checks of the model's performance on your validation set. So this validation set is really just to measure the error of your model trained thus far on new data. Mean, new data meaning data it has not seen during training. 
And then typically, um, when you look at your training loss or your validation loss on a plot like we see here, as your number of training steps increases, you expect your training error to go down because with each new training example, uh, your model should get better at learning that relationship of the training data. And, and while you expect your validation loss to go down at the start, eventually you're, you're likely to see your validation error start to increase. And this is a sign of overfitting. And that, that red dotted line is say, meant to say like, this is kind of the sweet spot for where your model is not underfit. So on the, on the very far left, both your validation and training error are high. So you're underfitting your model, like underfitting your data. On the right-hand side of this picture, we see the training error is low, yet our validation error is high, which is an indication that we're not doing well on unseen data. We are no longer generalizing well. And so there's a sweet spot in the picture we saw before that sort of aligns with where the, the red dotted line is. So that's the typical rule that you learn about is like you want to avoid overfitting and it's like a, a mantra. It's like, okay, and you learn a series of techniques and methods and regularization techniques to combat overfitting that you might have in your, in your data. And so this, this design pattern though is called useful overfitting. So the idea here is there are some situations where you want to overfit and overfitting even though holistically and overall you want to avoid you want to be aware of some scenarios where there is such thing as useful overfitting. And one example that we discuss is, um, you know, when using machine learning models to approximate solutions to dynamical systems or partial differential equations, in those situations in particular, it's really helpful to rethink the role of overfitting. So to say a little bit more, um, consider, for example, the, the, the problem of simulating behavior of some physical or dynamical system Things like the problems you might find in like climate science or computational biology or computational finance. So in these systems, the time dependence of observations can be described by a mathematical function or um, a series of mathematical or a, a set of mathematical functions, uh, oftentimes in, expressed in, in the form of a partial differential equation of a PDE. And so, you know, with these with these dynamical systems, oftentimes you can write down the PDEs. Uh, and the, uh, the equations that govern can be formally, ex the, those, those rules can be formally expressed, but they don't have a closed form solution. So it's oftentimes you're not lucky enough to be able to say, okay, from this PDE or the system of PDEs, here, here's my solution, here's my formula. So instead, a lot of the field of, of, of PDEs is uh, um, developing classical numerical methods uh, to approximate solutions of those systems. And uh, instead, you have to find discrete continuations or discretiz discretizations uh, that a computer can use to solve or to approximate a continuous partial differential equation. And the way that's typically done is to achieve convergence, you do like a mesh spacing of, the, of this discretization, uh, um, discretization on your domain. And you take a smaller and smaller grid and you, and you hope that you can show that the solutions you had uh, converge to some extent. But the problem is, is often not very feasible, like um, in an actual numerical method standpoint, because achieving 10 times higher resolution uh, requires 10,000 times more compute because you have typically three spatial dimensions, maybe a temporal dimension. And so this idea of just like taking finer grids um, and then using classical numerical methods doesn't quite, doesn't quite work. So enter machine learning. And there's been a lot of work recently in using machine learning to do exactly that process, to learn uh, a solution to a differential equation, but using machine learning methods. So in this case, it's possible to use machine learning to build a model that approximates those solutions of that, of, of, you know, in this case, we're looking, we're thinking about um, doing like satellite imagery, where we may have like a forwarded radiative uh, transfer model, which is understanding how radiation is influencing um, the, what, the weather patterns that we might see in satellite imagery. So this ML approximation can be made close enough to the solution of the model that was originally achieved using classical methods, but it has an advantage because it's much faster to compute. Like we're, we're then, we're taking this uh, collection of data from our observe our observations, and then we're just using a machine learning model to approximate what a solution of a P the PDE might actually look like. So the, the advantage is that the inference using the learned machine learning approximation, which is, which is needed to calculate the closed form solution, takes only a fraction of the time um, to carry out the actual like the numerical method you would use otherwise. So when using machine learning methods like this to approximate PDEs, um, it's necessary to rethink the role of overfitting. Like typically you would say collect some data, do that train validation split, but, but not here, right? So in fact, in this example, uh, it's an example of when it's acceptable to overfit. In fact, you want to overfit. 
Like you want your model to learn, to memorize and to learn exactly that input, those input examples that you have from your physical observations. Um, the ML model needs to learn precise, uh, needs to learn that lookup precisely calculated uh, over the inputs and all the outputs and splitting the data into a training data set and an evaluation data set is counterproductive because then you're expecting the model to be able to like learn a relationship from your training data and extrapolate to your validation data. And that's not what we're trying to do here. We're just trying to like learn a model that can reproduce those inputs and outputs. Um, instead, the observations are collected from the physical environment and then used as the inputs, like a, almost like a lookup table for a physics-based model that carries out this iterative numerical calculations to calculate the precise state of the system. So as a takeaway, um, overfitting, you wanna keep in mind, overfitting is useful when, they're, when the two conditions are met. Like one, there's, there's no, no, no noise. So the labels are accurate for all the instances. When, because you're doing this way where you're using a machine learning model to approximate that lookup, you wanna make sure there's no noise in your actual data. Um, and also you wanna make sure that you have a complete data set at your disposal. So um, if you're dealing with unbounded domains or domains that involve um, you know, time going off to infinity, then you're, you're somewhat limited in, in, the, in how much you can utilize these techniques just because you wanna make sure you have the complete data set at your disposal. So for each of the patterns that we discuss, um, we also discuss like trade-offs and alternatives, just things to keep in mind. Like if you're discussing this pattern with a colleague, you wanna think of these as like, okay, here's a useful thing you wanna keep in mind, but you know, here's, here's a trade-off, like here's something you wanna keep in mind if you're using it. And so one trade-off to keep in mind um, in terms of this use case for, for useful overfitting is, um, is that when the underlying system that you're trying to model uh, is known to be a chaotic dynamical system. So the machine learning model essentially functions as an approximation of a lookup table for the inputs and outputs of the physical observations that you have in your data set. Uh, when the lookup table is small, you know, don't don't use machine learning. Like if your lookup table is small, if your domain is small, if your if your problem is contained, then just use a lookup table because really we're using machine learning as a way of that, of that approximation. It's when that lookup table becomes too unwieldy or too large, or the compute time to actually do a lookup is so long uh, that you want to you know instead maybe think about using machine learning model to approximate that lookup table. Um, and what's happening under the hood, right, is this machine learning model is interpolating uh, by weighing unseen values by the, you know, using the distances between those unseen values. So you can do like, you know, here I'm just showing a picture of a lookup table for a simple function like sigmoid. Um, you know, those points in between my lookup table, a machine learning model is like learning what that function might look like. So uh, one, you're not using any validation stuff because you want to give it all possibility of, of having it. But you want to keep in mind that if you're dealing with a chaotic system, that even those very small changes in between your what the known values um, can have dramatic differently outcomes in the uh, in when you're computing when you're approximating your interpolation. So um, it's a really useful tool. It's a really useful technique. You want to you know think about how you can use you want to overfit your data set when you're doing this, uh, building a an approximation in this way. But just be aware that the more chaotic your dynamical system is that governs your your solutions. Um, the more likely you may run into problems when you're building, when you're, when you're using machine learning. So some way, one way that people get around this is by using Monte Carlo methods to create a robust set of inputs. So when tabulating all possible inputs, you know, that may not be possible. Uh, you can take a Monte Carlo approach of sampling the input space. Um, this is especially useful when not all possible combinations of inputs are even physically possible. So in these cases, even though we were saying before, like you want to, you're getting your data and then you want to overfit on it, you know, because you're using this Monte Carlo method to sort of generate, you know, the inputs and the, the inputs and outputs for your lookup, um, it is possible here that you can overfit. And so, so, you know, take this with a grain of salt, but what you want to be able to do then is use a combination of low complexity models and some regularization to, to be aware of like how much you might be overfitting when you're using additional techniques to fill in the rest of the values for your for your lookup. So um, overfitting is isn't so much of a concern when the number of parameters that you have uh, is is less than the, the amount of data you have that you that you're starting with. But when your data set is is larger than the number of free parameters, then you may start to you may start to overfit. And so you want to be aware of that. Um, one, I'll, I'll, I'll end this conversation on overfitting with just another sort of like other thing to keep in mind, like an alternative way of thinking about it 
and this is a little bit uh, of a sidestep, but um, you know, in building any machine learning model, it's often often the advice you may often see is how it's useful to overfit on a single batch. So I'll just mention two more ways in which overfitting can be useful, in addition to the ML approximation theory we were discussing before. So you should think about overfitting on a single batch as a good sanity check, both for your model code and to make sure that your data input pipeline is working well. Um, again, like based on your experiments in building machine learning models, you know that a lot of work and a lot of code goes into building an input pipeline to get your data to your model, and then also like just building the model itself. Like you're you're, you're putting you're attaching a lot of layers, you're you're making a lot of like design choices. Um, you know, when it's all said and done, you can get lost, you can lose the forest for the trees, and you can get a little bit lost in the weeds of, uh, of actually the code of building a model, which whatever language you're using, or whatever uh, library you're using. And so a good, a good like gut check or a good sanity check is to overfit on a single batch. So take your data and then run it through your data pipeline, your training pipeline, and train a number of steps and really see that your model can overfit a single batch of data. The reason why I say that is because you should be able to overfit. If you have a small enough batch of data and a complex enough model, you should be able to memorize the data. And you should see that training error going to zero. If you don't, that's a good indication that you may have made some mistake in your data pipeline or the way you're feeding data, there could be a bug that you're not aware of. It's a good sort of like integration test for your machine learning modeling just to overfit on a single batch. Um, uh, along the, that same that same like philosophy is the the role of overfitting in building a machine learning model in general. And if you read books on like deep learning and articles, um, and you read about regularization, you'll see like some of the common advice is to build a model, like whatever data set you're working with, build a model that's large enough and complex enough and has enough capacity to overfit on that on that data set, and then apply regularization to um, to combat overfitting. So one of the rules of thumbs you'll probably see and maybe you've even used and I recommend when you're developing, like you have a complex problem, you have a complex data set, you know, think about overfitting uh, one as a debugging tool, but also as a way of like development. Like instead of starting to build up, build up your model to be able to like learn a data set perfectly, um, the advice you'll, you, you'll read is to say, actually the best fitting model is a large model that has been properly regularized. So what you should do is just throw everything at your data set. Like just take a take the biggest, fanciest, you know, all the layers you can. And once you're overfitting, then start to apply regularization to, to address uh, overfitting on the on the um, validation set. So the code snippet here just shows you, you know, that first aspect of overfitting on a single batch using the data set API and TensorFlow and building various models, it's pretty straightforward to do. Again, that code is on the repo. If you want to like run through an example and see how it actually looks in practice, um, you know, you're just pulling out a single batch and then you're repeating over that batch as you train. So, okay. So the, the last design pattern that I wanted to talk about is explainable predictions. And um, I'm just a little cautious of time. I think we're good. I'll finish here. And then uh, I know some questions coming up. I'll come back and go through and answer some questions uh, once we, once I go through this, just to make sure we give time to those questions, and I'm happy to stay on late and talk more. Um, so we have a, the final chapter of the book on design patterns is uh, responsible AI and um, the development of AI. It's creating new opportunities to improve the lives of people around the world. Um, you see, you know, there's articles I feel like every day now about new uses of of how AI, AI is doing great things. Um, there's also new uses of the high AI is maybe not doing such great things. Um, and so this chapter is meant to sort of think about those kind of aspects of, of what it means to build, to be responsible, uh, build responsible AI. Um, and that touches on topics involving fairness and explainability and privacy and security. So uh, in the book, we discuss three patterns in detail. We discuss like a heuristic benchmark. So um, I won't go into much detail for that, but it's just like a, a way of being able to communicate what your model is doing uh, to stakeholders. Um, we talk about explainable predictions and we talk about ML fairness. So how you apply a fairness lens to your models. And so for the purposes right now, I'm gonna focus on just explainability. So this term explainability, I, I don't know, I, I think it's great because I feel like I see more and more conversation about AI explainability. 
Um, but it's today it's used to mean many different things and it means different things to different people uh, for a lot of executives who are overseeing new investments in AI in their companies. Um, explainability often means something very broad, like touching on things like accountability or transparency or auditability. Um, you know, that's that often shows up, you know, from a practitioner's perspective, you always want to have some like, human in the loop because you want to be able to like understand how to interpret and understand what your model is, what your model is uh, predicting. Um, at Google, this is a, a really important topic and we spend a lot of time talking about this and making sure that we're designing systems for everybody. Uh, and we think about explainability as the process of understanding and communicating how or why a machine learning model makes certain predictions or inferences. We just wanna understand why is the model making the prediction it's making. And so that's what I mean when I talk about like explainable predictions and explainable AI. So explainable AI refers to, you know, by now there are lots of different techniques and methods uh, for, uh, for, for uh, evaluating models. And we just wanna understand why a model is giving a specific solution. So it's become more and more necessary because really powerful models tend to not, tend to be very hard to explain. Like a lot of these models are these like large complex deep neural networks or these black box models and really understanding exactly what collection of weights happened in a model to cause a model to make a certain prediction or a certain inference, it's nearly impossible to really trace it back and understand. Um, luckily, a lot of new techniques have been developed over the years. This is not necessarily a new field, but there's been a lot of uh, interest recently to better understand these, um, these black box models. So we're aiming for two things here. First, to understand what the model is doing. So like it's logic, the reasoning, the why. And secondly, to be able to communicate that to people in the business, right? So, you know, it sort of, it sort of spans both from for a practitioner all the way up to the stakeholders. And so this is really meant to say like, you know, that, that idea of model understanding um, looks differently for different stakeholders. So, you know, my role, uh, I'm primarily an ML engineer and we do a lot of building models. And for me, I find like the, the explainability techniques um, and being able to explain predictions is, is necessary for understanding, uh, increasing the understanding of, of how your model is performing. Um, when, you, when you understand why your model is making certain predictions, um, ideally you're focused, usually you're focused on why it's making incorrect predictions. You can then improve the performance of your model and just build better algorithms. Um, oftentimes we're then taking that model, we're handing it off to a consumer or working with a customer of some sort and as I communicate to a customer or to a cons some consumer why the model is making those predictions, it gives increased trust for like what the model is doing. It allows me to be able to combat any bias or transparency that um, any bias I have in the model and I have transparency, be able to understand how that model is being used in the system. And then even beyond that, and this part I don't touch so much in my day job, but, but now and more and more, this is entering the conversation early on, is how this, uh, this need for explainability uh, relates to regulators. So again, with increased trust and bias, but now more and more, there's actually like compliance and reports need to be written to understand um, systems that rely on machine learning models predictions, why those models are predicting what they're predicting. So it's a really important, uh, it's, it's important to understand a model's behavior. It's critical to many tasks. Um, as, a, as a little summary, you know, you want to think about it as a way of explaining why an individual data point received a prediction or why your model is making certain predictions. Um, I find it useful as a way of debugging odd behavior from a model. Like if you, again, depending on your background, your experience, once you're built a model, you, you want to put it in the wild and see how it performs. And you're mostly, you care, start caring about where's your model getting it wrong. And, you know, if you only just get a negative prediction, uh, a false prediction, that's not very helpful. Uh, under, using explainability techniques, you can better be able to debug why your model is getting things incorrect, uh, which then, again, leads this iterative process of refining um, and, and verifying that a model's behavior is acceptable, meaning you understand why it's making its predictions, and so you can trust or you can understand better how it may make predictions on unseen data sets or unseen um, groups that you're not aware of. And then, ultimately, it's a really useful tool for presenting the, the gist of a model to stakeholders. So people who are, don't really care about your Keras model at all, they just care about being able to understand and regulate why the model is making its predictions. Uh, this is just an example that I, I really like that explains this where, uh, you know, you're looking at why a model, there's a, there's a model that was being developed to do CT, to, to analyze uh, chest x-rays, CT scans. 
And they noticed that what happened was the model was making these uh, false predictions uh, for certain parts of, 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 um, of, of, uh, of the images, the x-ray images. And they saw that what actually happened by zooming in and seeing like what was causing the model to make that prediction, um, we'll talk about some techniques in a second, uh, they saw that actually it was caused by the, the marks from the from position on the CT scan. So it's a good indication of being like, okay, like we understand why our model is making its predictions. So I mentioned before, there's lots of different explainability methods. And I just wanna go through just briefly um, and highlight like how they break down. So this is a taxonomy of explainability methods. Um, and at the very bottom of the leaves of this tree, you can see there's, there's a lot of techniques there. Again, based on your familiarity, or if you've done any explainability before, you've probably seen some techniques that you've, that you've even used. So uh, very holistically, when you're talking about explainable predictions and explainable AI, um, you can first dichotomize uh, explainability methods into intrinsic and post hoc. So when I talk about intrinsic here, I'm thinking about model structures that actually lend themselves very well to interpretability and explainability. Uh, things like decision trees or sparse linear models, um, not like deep neural networks. Uh, for that, we want to think about more like post hoc techniques, meaning after we've trained our model, there's a collection of techniques we can use to better understand why that model is making its predictions. Um, so on that post hoc side, you can aim to understand predictions at a local or a global level. So for a, for a local level, what I mean is you want to understand the contributions of input variables to understand why your made model made a certain prediction for one single example. Like it, it predicted something, true or false, or some value for a single training data point, uh, example data point. And you want to understand why, what, how, what was the importance of those input variables for that data point that caused my model to make its prediction. Um, that could be contrasted with a global approach, which means you have your model and you want to understand on a global level why how is my model behaving or why is it making certain predictions for you know on a whole um, typically when you're looking at global techniques you're doing some averaging or ranking ranking of contribution input variables uh, and you may be actually like you leveraging what you know about local variables to get some like aggregated information and then lastly you know thinking you know back down the next level down would be okay you know there you know in addition to like local and global you can think about explainability techniques as being model specific or model agnostic. So model specific means it's a technique for model explainability that works for that model. So, you know, like weights for linear models or directional feature contributions for tree based ensemble models. Like these are all explainability techniques that work for a certain model type. And then the model agnostic here, of course, refers to techniques, which doesn't really matter what the model looks like. Uh, the techniques would work for whatever whatever model you're using. It's just treating the model as like an input in the, like an API. So um, ultimately, which techniques you use depends a lot on your use case, and it also may depend on your data type. But you can get explainability, explainable predictions for any data type. So here, you know, you may maybe you're dealing with images, or you're dealing with text, or you're dealing with tabular data. You know, when you actually apply some of these explainability techniques, like for images. You can start to see um, using, I'll talk a little, bit, a little bit about integrated gradients, but techniques like integrated gradients allow you to see how individual pixels of an image contribute to a prediction. Um, so there's techniques for, for image. For text, maybe you're trying to determine the sentiment of a score, uh, of, a, of, a, of a phrase. In that case, you can actually give positive or negative sentiment to, you can see how they relate to the actual words in the text. And for tabular data, which may have a lot of problems to deal with, um, you have your tabular values, and for each one of your input values, like distance, <coughs> excuse me, start hour, max temp, et cetera, you have a feature value telling you like what's the value of that feature, and then you have an attribution value. And here the attribution is telling you like how much is that one feature contributing to the prediction, um, maybe in a positive way, maybe in a negative way. So I won't go into a lot of the detail about like all the many different techniques. Uh, one we talk about in the in the chapter, and one that we have some code for are uh, Shackley values that can be easily computed to give you feature um, attribution scores for for models, uh, and also integrated gradients. So integrated gradients, we kind of saw that picture in the image, and it, it just sort of explains the idea well. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about integrated gradients. So for example, we have a, a model that maybe is predicting what the image contains. Here, the image for the label may be fireboat. Um, we can use integrated gradients to understand why that model is making that predicted, giving that predicted label. So um, the way it works is you start off with a baseline image, 
something like this, just a black edge. And then you scale the image up to its full intensity. Along the way, you see how your model makes its predictions. Um, along, um, and, and in doing so, you see that at some point, the model crosses a threshold, right, of, of, of being confident uh, between zero and one that that image has a certain label or it's going to prescribe a certain label of fireboat to that image. Uh, and that's kind of like the aha moment. Like somewhere around here is where the, 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 the pixels have been, um, you know, scaled enough so that the model knows what it wants to predict. And these are really uninteresting gradients. And so the technique of interested in integrating gradients is really looking at that scaling factor and you're computing a line integral over all the pixel values of your images as you move from your baseline to your full image. And you're learning how much does each one pixel matter. And so what you find is you say, okay, like this is the image. It had the label of a, of a fireboat. Um, and the explanation highlights the pixels that contributed to that prediction. And so you can then answer and say, okay, like, you know, am I happy with that? Is that what I expect for this model? You can apply integrated gradients using AI platform on Google Cloud. Um, we tried to be pretty agnostic in the book. So we, we talk about, you know, other technologies as well. We are all Google engineers. So a lot of the examples that we have relate to how they work with Keras and TensorFlow and on Google Cloud. But there are many, many examples in the book that use PyTorch or talk about um, uh, AWS or are there other, other, other tech stacks. But uh, I'll just say a few words about how this looks for uh, Cloud AI Platform. So to use integrated gradients for a model you've deployed on AI Platform, there's really just four steps. You, you create your model in TensorFlow, you save it on Cloud Storage, you create an explanation metadata file, which is really just a way of describing what that baseline image should look like, or your baseline example. Um, you deploy your model and a version on Cloud AI Platform. And then when you submit your predictions for requests, you can, you, you can get an explanation as to why. Like you get, a, you get it'll tell you um, attributions for the features of your model. So again, I'll, I won't spend a lot of time going through the code because this is really just to give you an idea. But here, you know, I've left out the, the meat of it anyway. It's really just setting up a, a, a sequential model. We compile the model, we train, um, and then we, set, we save our models to some location in cloud storage uh, so that we can, oh, it's about to go away in the last two lines. We export the save model to cloud storage so that we can deploy the model. Um, when I mentioned before, you create a, a metadata JSON file you want to set up a JSON file that, that gives the baselines, the input baselines for your model. So in your mind, you should think about like um, for the images, maybe it's a black image or a completely blank image. Maybe that baseline is random noise. Uh, the choice and selection of a baseline we talk about in the book, and it's an important, it's important thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about how you're going to use a technique for getting explainable predictions. Um, here, we just set up a, a JSON that would say, okay, well, we'll maybe we'll take a, a black image. Um, and then when we create the version, we can say which explainability method we want to use. Right now on AI platform, uh, Shapley values are supported and also integrated gradients. And so you can say, okay, I want to use integrated gradients using the heuristic that I described earlier. Um, you're really just computing a, a line integral of that gradient. Uh, and so you give a, the number of integral steps here just integrates the approximate number of steps for that uh, discretization of that continuous line integral you're actually computing. So that when it comes time to making predictions to explain, you can call AI platform explain, you pass the model, the version, and the, maybe the text example you want to predict. And then, you know, here I've done this for a, I've shown you the code for a tabular model, um, but for each of the feature names, you have the feature values, and you can see the attribution values. And these values come from um, what we saw from the integrated gradients. So, We've gone through three different patterns and uh, I, I'm a little bit conscious of time, so I'll, I'll, stop, I'll stop in a second. I'll just give a quick summary. Uh, these patterns show up in different areas of the machine learning, machine learning life cycle. Um, we first talked about rebalancing. That one is discussed in the chapter on data representation. So how we actually want to um, represent the, the, the problem of our, of our machine learning solution. Uh, it's a, the problem there solved is dealing with heavily imbalanced data. And we, there are different solutions that we discuss. We discuss downsampling, upsampling, or using a weighted loss function, uh, depending on the different considerations. Um, next, we talked about useful overfitting. That falls in the chapter on patterns that modify the training loop. So think of the typical machine learning training loop. There's different like bells and whistles and things you can do to adjust that, that typical training loop. We put useful overfitting design pattern in there. 
And again, this is a problem that's solved that's addressing um, using machine learning methods to, to learn physics-based models or dynamical systems. And the solution is, you know, in this idea, like you, you forego the idea of overfitting. Like typically when you're building a machine learning model, you don't want to overfit, but in this situation, that's your goal. And then lastly, we ended with explainable predictions. This falls in the responsible AI chapter. The problem that this patent means to address is this issue of trying to understand why a model makes certain predictions, um, for either for debugging purposes or for regulatory and compliance standards. And the solution is um, there's lots of techniques. You can apply various uh, model explainability techniques. You can look at our GitHub repo where we, I think there we have an example also that uses SHAP. Um, and it's a way of just providing more user trust and understanding why a model makes its predictions. So I'll stop there. Um, I will say, like, if you're interested in buying the book, there's a discount going on right now. Or if you if you go from O'Reilly, so we'll need to share the uh, we can share the O'Reilly link. But um, you actually don't need this discount code. But I'll I'll leave it here in case it's about it about later. Uh, all the proceeds of the book go to the group Girls Who Code. So um, that I think is really great. Anything you buy is, is just going to benefit Girls Who Code, uh, which is a group in the U.S. that's uh, it tries to enable um, women and young women to get into computer science and STEM fields. Um, okay, so I'm going to stop there. I know there may be some questions, so I'm I'm done. Let me go over to the uh, chat and see if there's any questions we can answer. I know there's a little bit of a lag. Okay, so let me, let's see uh, about questions. Okay. I see a question that's saying that should upsampling be associated with some noise injection perturbation to not copy exactly the same data points? So. Um, there's different ways you can do upsampling, and one technique we discussed was just repeating a, set, a data point exactly. And so sometimes you'll see in the upsampling, you randomly upsample, meaning you randomly repeat a data point exactly as it is. This idea of adding noise injection or perturbation is closer to the idea of smoke, which is another form of upsampling. But in that case, what you're doing is you're creating new data points but you're perturbing a little bit something that you know as it existed in your data set. So, um, uh, so yeah, you can you can do both. Is it possible to apply the rebalancing pattern in cases of time series anomaly detection? I would say um, it's a little bit more tricky when you're dealing with time series. So um, anomaly detection in general is is a kind of a field where uh, you find yourself probably using rebalancing techniques. Um, sometimes the anomalies are so sparse that even the techniques I described, the um, downsampling, upsampling, and weight classes, may not be enough. And you know, in the book, we also talk about other alternatives like using autoencoders or using like uh, more statistical-based methods for doing anomaly detection. So I will say, like, yes, like it is something you could probably do. You have to take care in building, um, in in doing any of those techniques with time series, just because. Uh, the way you're downsampling, the way you're upsampling is going to is going to change a lot. Uh, oh, interesting. Using GANs, I think I saw that also, and I've done some work in GANs myself. But um, this, this this is a question saying there's a talk by Goodfellow on using GANs to create synthetic data, but this has restrictions. I have seen people uh, there are some papers where people are using GANs to recreate synthetic tabular data, or people are just using that as a way of building fake data sets to further Chain models, but I haven't pushed the limits of how how well that works or where the what the state of the art of that is. Um, a good way to think about useful overfitting is to understand that overfitting in cases of high dimensional data is actually some form of learning. It's actually progress. I like that. Yeah, um, you know, for high dimensional data, like you're you're learning something, and you have to keep in mind the use case. Like if the goal is to generalize, like typically the goal of machine learning models is to generalize the unseen data. Um, and so uh, you, you use this technique of having a training set and a validation set. But yeah, overfitting is, is one of these things that like, it's a tool. And especially when it comes, like I mentioned at the very end about like using it as debugging or as a way of, um, or as a, as a way of like developing a model, it's a, it's a really useful tool.
Um, I, I know a little bit about Coleman filters, but yeah, this is a, it's a very similar technique, right? So what you're doing is you're, you're having this dynamical system and you're, you really want to understand like how the system progresses from one state to the next. Um, and, uh, and in doing so, you can, you really want to, it's like a lookup, right? You're saying like, when I'm here in this state, I'm going to progress to this, ne this state next. And you can write in a series of equations when you're using like systems of PDEs to govern how that system evolves or how that dynamical system changes. And so, um, uh, I, yeah, that would be, they're, they're very closely related. So I would, I would keep that in mind when looking at common filters in general. Uh, okay. There's not overfitting is increasing logic. I think we refer to his use of regular techniques to avoid filter cases. Yeah, so so I'm not sure this this comment may have come. This comment says um, over not, but but that is not overfitting is increasing the model complexity. I think it refers to the use of regulation techniques that can be avoided for those cases. This may have come in the talk when I was saying like you know when you want to be careful of like too much overfitting. Uh, maybe when you're using Monte Carlo methods to to fill in missing data from your from your lookup. Um, I think in general, the idea is like overfitting happens for a couple of reasons. One, like you're just, you know, you're, you're showing the data more and more training steps. You can also overfit from model complexity. And so um, usually regularization techniques are, 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 are good for combating overfitting. Like just by definition, they're meant to de decrease the generalization error. And so that can look like um, in, you know, using dropout or using L1 or L2 regularization, or maybe using early stopping where you're limiting the number of training steps. Um, but yeah, these are all techniques for regularization. Um, there is, so we referenced some papers. Okay, this question is saying, is there a stream of research that demonstrates it's possible to further reduce the validation error after the interpolation threshold, hence having a double descent in error curve? And there is, there's a paper that we reference in that section that was saying, you know, like when you're, you know, when, like when you overfit and you can like see how your training and validation losses um, there's like a double dip, like a, a double descent in the error curve. So I can't remember the title of that article off the top of my head, but I, I know we reference it in the in this section. Um, I can find that link and I'll send it to the group. Oh, okay. The attribution scores look like the weights of principal components. Ah, interesting. Um, there, I'm sure there's a, there's a close relationship that could be made here, but in my mind, they're, they're sort of like, they're, they're, they're pointing in different, they're thinking, they're doing different things, right? So principal component analysis for like sort of breaking down the essence of, a, of the features and figuring out like what are the, 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 the most important linearly independent directions that, that control uh, the data set or um, that manage the data set. And here the attribution score is doing something similar, but it's more focused on the predictions on the end saying like, okay, my model has made these predictions, why? Like what's the aspect? causing my model to make that prediction. So it's kind of like looking at the same idea from two perspectives, either from the data or from the, the labels. Ah, thanks, Will. Uh, the interesting, yeah, in, in, integrated gradients are, um, are, really, are really fun. Cool. Yeah, responsible AI is a very hot topic. Um, just as a preview of what is in the book, but we have not covered today, what are the high-level techniques covered in the model versioning pattern? Ah, yeah, we could talk about that as well. Um, uh, again, just for sake of time, I can't go into much, too much detail, but yeah, so the, the, the patterns in the book are broken down into uh, sort of like where they fall in the ML workflow, um, like the problem, the data representation, the problem representation, the, the modifying the training loop. We spend a lot of time talking about ML ops, like ML ops has also become really important. I saw there was some discussion about ML ops, even in the first beginning of this conversation. Um, and so there we talk about things like model versioning, uh, ML pipelines. We talk about techniques involving like resilience and repeatability and re reproducibility in general, uh, like things like continuous model evaluation. So the high level techniques covered in model versioning is just like why you want to do it. Every pattern in the book is discussed in terms of what's the problem? Like, where does this come up? Like, why would you even care about this? And so here's the problem. The solution is the pattern. So the solution is to use model versioning. And then we go into why it works. Like, why does model versioning work? Like, why does this thing work the way it does? And then we have a little section on trade-offs and alternatives. So if you're gonna do model versioning, like keep this in mind, do it this way. And so uh, for that one, the high level techniques are just like, you know, having a, a rest, restful endpoint for different model versions 
uh, depending on data or depending on model improvements, whatever it may be, so that you can uh, easily swap out different model versions. Have you ever faced a problem in which your training in your law set goes down, but invalidation set does not go down? I'm not overfitting, but I'm not running this case. I can say I have just because I feel like I've seen so many things go counterintuitively and weird. It's it's weird, right? Like um, your training law, as I say, your training law set, the training, well, your loss in the training set goes down, but in the validation set, oh, this is actually, well, I, 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 I maybe a little bit confused, Ricardo, but it sounds like your question is describing what I would think of as overfitting. Um, a problem in, the, in which your loss in your training set goes down, but the validation set does not go down. Oh, you mean your validation error probably like never decreases. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe this is, I mean, uh, certainly you see like all crazy kind of behaviors. Uh, this is where I think it's always really good advice just to like, I don't know, like I, I sort of go back and want to think about how to uh, overfit on a batch or really understand like why, why that's, why that model, why it's happening that way. So really under like, I don't know, try to understand is your split that fair? Like you're maybe even go back to look at how you made your training and validation split. Like you should be learning something that allows you to generalize and something's going on there. Um, I can't remember if the double descent paper was related only to ResNex, but uh, definitely worth, I'll, 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 I'll jog my memory and check. The overfitting in PDEs of physical systems is due to an extreme complexity of physical systems. Um, I think so. I think here the idea is just saying like, when you're, when you're using a, a, a machine learning model as a way of approximating a solution to a system of PDEs, um, you you really do want like you're just using it as a faster lookup like you're 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 learning that that input output table um and you're 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 using that model as a way of doing that and so you want to overfit if you can um more on engineering side of things but i think so the question is what's the hardest problem you encountered so far in applied in you know, engineering more on the engineering side of things rather than modeling i i think that sort of hits the nail on the head like typically the hardest problems are less about the modeling, um, you know, there's so many amazing tools these days that you can use that lower the bar for building really, really impressive, really fancy models. And you go into a problem thinking like, I'm gonna spend a lot of time developing a model. But um, for me, I think the hardest problems are working with customers and integrating that model into like, you know, deploying that model, like getting that model deployed, kind of like the ML ops aspects related to model development or like, you know, after model development, like the, the deployment stage. The reason why they're hard for me is because, not hard for me in particular, but like they're hard because everyone's system is different and you really have to take into account the needs and the, and the requirements of that customer or where they are and like what's and what they need. And so it's a much less, it's a much, it's a much more like a problem solving in my mind than just being like, okay, here's a data set, do your thing, you know, ma maximize the accuracy. Like, that's hard enough, but then typically the uh, the applied aspect of like deployment, um, monitoring models, like even doing continuous, we have a section on like on the resilience when we talk about like continuous model evaluation and um, and like, you know, dealing with data schemas that change in time and how you deal with all of that, like these resiliency techniques. Uh, that stuff usually when you're trying to make, make take ML from the bench to the real world, in my mind, it's the hardest part. Um, yeah, my validation set decreased, but never increased to, that's funny. Well, keep going. And if your validation, it never decreases. <laughs> I'd, I would check your validate. Like sometimes, yeah, I would check your splits and I would check your validation data. Like something, something might not be going right with how the data is being fed for validation. Like you would expect to see some change. It's easy for me to say, but, um, I have to look at it a little bit closer. Okay. I know I've gone for a while. I don't think there's any more questions in the, I think I hit every question in the, uh, in the, in the chat. So let me stop there and let's at this. Okay. I'll stop presenting. Okay. I'll, I'll stop. Thank you, Mike. Uh, 
Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you again, everyone, for your attention. And thank you for the opportunity to come and speak. It's been a lot of fun. If you have any other questions, feel free to reach out. It was a great pleasure for us you know, having you as a guest speaker. So we will share with the rest of the community the slides, I guess. If you yep. can also share with us, we'll publish it. And the video is on YouTube, so it will be available for offline viewing. And yeah, so everybody feel free to uh, reach out Michael if you have any other question. Yeah, um, I'll share the slides and I'll share that link to the to the book. It should have the discount applied already. But yeah, thanks again, everyone, for your attention. It's been great. Thank thanks you. Great for the opportunity to come talk to us.